Hello everyone, I once again welcome you all to the last lecture of MSP lecture series on transmetallic chemistry. In this lecture, I shall consolidate whatever I discussed in last 59 lectures in the form of summary and conclusions. To begin with, what I did was I gave a historical background to the periodic table. Why I gave it is very important to know how many of these people contributed to bring all the known elements in the form of a table to understand their chemistry and also to do comparison and also giving some order as I had mentioned periodic table is nothing but place for every element and every element in its place. So, meticulously it was done and it was published by Dimitri Mandeleev in 1869, but however at least 50 years before this concept came into the mind of Dimitri Mandeleev, several other all chemists or physicists, chemists in general scientists worked very hard to arrange those elements in a organized manner. In that context, I call all these uh, people as periodic table scientists. You can see here among them who stands taller, if you ask me it is Anthony Levasseur. He changed the perception of understanding of science and chemistry at the time when people were not going in a different direction uh, to propagate the advancement of science. At that time, uh, he brought the concept of quantitative analysis instead of qualitative analysis and he can be called as father of modern chemistry. And of course, he named oxygen and hydrogen and also he named several other elements. He also discovered silicon and unfortunately at the age of 51, he was guillotined. Next, Mandeleev published his uh, period table in 1869, but before that triad system came into picture by John Newland and then he also talked about uh, octave and then John Jacob Berzelius named several elements and gave symbols for them. And when periodic table was published by Dimitri Mandeleev, he gave an important statement that physical and chemical properties of elements are periodic functions of their atomic weight. But later, Henry Mersley through extensive photoelectron spectroscopy he determined atomic number and several properties of elements and eventually he, he modified the understanding of periodic table giving importance to atomic number and thus it was modified as the periodic functions of atomic number that means physical and chemical properties of elements are periodic functions of their atomic number. Now we know that how valuable the atomic number is that is electronic configuration and number of electrons and once we know the electronic configuration and with basic understanding of uh, periodic trends and periodic uh, properties, we should be able to deduce all properties and understanding the reactivity, stability, etc. And during the same time when Dimitri Mandeleev presented his periodic table, Julius Lothar Mayer from Germany was almost ready even one year before, but somehow he did not publish. It does not mean that he did not contribute, his contributions are very significant and due to some reason he did not publish his periodic table that was very similar to what Dimitri Mandeleev presented. And however, we can see in even in NCRT books, Lothar May's plot about trends among uh, trans elements. And of course, Glenn Seberg and Yuri Agenison were given distinction by naming elements with atomic number 207 and 218 after their name. And in fact, when element with atomic number 207 was named as Seaborgium, Glenn T. Seaborg was extremely happy and he said that it is more than this honor of naming a element after his name is, is more than getting a Nobel Prize. In fact, these are the only two people whose names were considered for two elements when they were alive. And of course, one should understand the trends in atomic radii or melting point, boiling point, ionization energy and try to analyze uh, to understand the properties, how it varies within the group and also along the period when you start filling from D0 to D10 electronic configuration. For example, you can see why manganese group 
shows decrease in melting points all these things are clearly spelled out in my lecture. Please give importance and attention to these things so that you can understand the behavior in a better way. It is very appropriate to remember Alfred Werner for his coordination theory. Again, when he started working on coordination compounds of cobalt, octahedral cobalt compounds and square planar complexes of platinum, there were no support of any analytical or spectroscopic tools. And not only that one, even atomic model, atomic structure was not known and even electrons were not known. In fact, he proposed his coordination theory in 1893, but electrons were discovered much later by J.J. Thompson in 1896. However, he did not leave any stone unturned with his synthetic ability and analytical thinking. He could make all possible isomers and also he brought isomerization concept and also he said why coordination number 6 would prefer octahedral geometry when you have coordination number 4, why certain molecules prefer square planar geometry, why certain molecules prefer tetrahedral geometry, all those things very nicely uh, he analyzed and he eventually he proposed his coordination theory during his time, his contemporary who had more inclination towards organic chemistry Jorgensen was always opposing and ridiculing uh, discoveries of Alfred Werner because he was proposing a theory called chain theory and always telling that no coordination compound can have coordination number more than 3. And also I showed you how the bonding was shown in uh, octahedral compounds of having different number of ammonia and chloride in his chain theory. And chain theory was a total flaw, but however he was also ridiculing coordination theory proposed by Alfred Werner, but in fact it even went to a personal abusing level, but however he tolerated all those things and he quietly worked hard and eventually he made everything very clear and then eventually he got the Nobel Prize in 1913. And uh, one more thing we should remember is about uh, making an optically active coordination compound having no carbon atoms. In fact, Jorgensen was again telling one cannot make any optically active compound without having a chiral carbon center. So with this, what he did was he made this compound, you can see there are no carbon atoms, only O and N are coordinating. He made this uh, chiral compound, he isolated both the enantiomers and then for his painstaking work and of recognizing this synthesis, he was given Nobel Prize in 1913. So now we know most of the concept still we are using whether it is reaction mechanism or whether it is uh, isomerism or whether it is understanding bonding concepts. And of course, crystal field theory is a very nice theory to explain bonding among coordination compounds to an extent ergonometric compounds, but there is also a flaw was there and nevertheless it is a fantastic bonding concept and it can explain many things, only thing is it does not consider covalency in the bonding metal to ligand bonding. However, uh, the best from valence bond theory that is mixing of orbitals that is a hybridization and then crystal field theory about uh, splitting of d orbitals were nicely imbibed into molecular orbital theory to come up with ligand field theory. Now ligand field theory having all these very good ingredients from these bonding concepts can literally explain everything including reactivity, stability and all those things. So this is how coordination chemistry progressed from Werner's coordination theory uh, and also in between I also told you earlier attempts to explain bonding uh, using electron neutrality principle and Kepert's model for using VSEPR theory to explain bonding all those things. And of course, crystal field theory is very, very important. In order to understand and to write crystal field splitting diagrams, uh, one should remember two things. One is relative orientation of d orbits with respect to Cartesian coordinates and also the direction of approach of ligand towards metal in different geometries. Once we know these things, understanding and writing crystal field splitting diagram for any geometry would be rather easy. Okay. So again to emphasize, I am showing you the orientation of orbitals and also the planes we come across x, y plane and then x, z plane and z, y plane. So now 
if you arrange all the orbitals and if you place ligands coming from different directions to establish a certain geometry, we can know now because of this interaction what would happen to the energy and how the degeneracy is destroyed and how they are arranged. Once we know understanding rest of uh, chemistry would be rather easy. This is for uh, dx minus y square and this is for dxy and then this is for dxz and this is for dyz. Once we know these things and also we know the geometry of uh, our ligand field, we can write crystal field splitting very easily for any given geometry. So now this is very, very important spectrochemical series and spectrochemical series the position of ligands in spectrochemical series can be uh, checked by looking into UV visible spectroscopy of complexes having these ligands. But on the other hand, uh, why a given ligand has taken or occupied a position somewhere here or here in the spectrochemical series cannot be explained by CFSC. CFSC can also only tell you where it is positioned, but why it is positioned you cannot tell. For that one, one has to understand the nature of the ligands and what kind of uh, uh, electrons they have and where the, in the donor orbits are located or whether it has donor and acceptor properties or it has only donor property or it has both donor and acceptor properties. So in that context, these pictures are very, very significant. So here you can see I have written three diagrams. Again, I am emphasizing we talk about pure sigma donor ligands. In that case, CFSC would remain like this. And when we consider a yes, sigma donor and pi donor ligands, for example, low laying filled sigma donor and low laying filled pi donor orbitals are there. In that case, what would happen because of overlapping and generation of molecular orbitals, the CFSC drops significantly. That is the reason these ligands are called as weak field ligands. So the CFSC does not tell why they are weak field ligands because of the, these two here, low lying sigma, filled sigma orbits and filled pi orbits they having low energy compared to metal T2G would signify why they are weaker ligands. And similarly, if you look into sigma donor and pi acceptor low energy filled sigma orbitals are there, high energy empty pi orbitals are there. In this case, what happens because of their overlapping, the CFSC in this fashion CFSC increases. So that means we should remember this one, the classification of ligands should be based on these three that is pure sigma donors and sigma donors and pi donors and sigma donors and pi acceptors. Once we know those things, understanding chemistry and utilizing them in some application would be very easy. Now let us look into MO diagram for square planar complex. If you just look into CFSE crystal field splitting here, this is the gap that determines CFSE among square planar complex. And again here, if you just look into it, this is the gap that we call it as frontier orbits, I would say, and this is a homo and lumo gap here. And if you consider here 8 electrons, 8 electrons are filled here. So up to here, 8 electrons are filled and then this will be homo and this will become lumo. So that means by extending this one, considering this crystal field splitting diagram and then considering the what kind of hybridization one can anticipate for square planar complexes getting information from VBT and then we consider these two and put into molecular orbit theory, this ligand field theory comes and it can explain very nicely all those things. And also I have given Mulliken symbols for uh, various d orbitals, just go through it and just look into it and try to understand. So now one more MO diagram I have given here for nickel tetracarbonyl. You can see here nickel tetracarbonyl, this lone pairs are placed here, higher in energy among all and this one essentially should go to the metal sp3 orbitals to establish metal to ligand bond, metal to nickel to carbonyl bond. But however, if you just look into this diagram, they are not participating, there is no overlapping of this one with S and P because they are too high in energy. So that means you should know the fact that NiCO4 does not have sigma or bonding at all. That means how this molecule is formed, it is because of back bonding only. You can see here, so these T2G electrons are getting placed in the molecular orbits generated by pi star and T2G of metal. So that means only the back bonding from nickel to carbon monoxide antibonding orbital is responsible for the existence of NiCO4. So that is the reason they are very unstable and also they are volatile. Whereas in case of metal carbonyl such as 
chromium hexacarbonyl, tungsten or even pentacarbonyl, we have seen the participation of both sigma as well as pi orbitals. In fact, all metal hexacarbonates are stable and solids having moderate stability. So now this four diagrams will tell you non-classical ligands having sigma donor and pi acceptor capabilities, carbon monoxide and phosphines and also Fischer carbine and N heterocyclic carbine. All of them are non-classical ligands having sigma donor and pi acceptor capabilities. And of course, there is relative difference in their donor and acceptor properties. Carbon monoxide may be very good sigma donor and also good pi acceptor no doubt. But phosphines can also compete well with carbon monoxide in terms of their sigma donor ability and pi acceptor ability. But in contrast to carbon monoxide, we can vary these things. We can vary these properties to an extent that it can even perform as a better pi acceptor compared to carbon monoxide when we have electron withdrawing groups or electronegative substituents on phosphorus. That means we should know that electronically we can tune the phosphines to make them better than carbon monoxide. For example, if you put more electron releasing groups on phosphorus, it can be a good sigma donor and a poor pi acceptor. On the other hand, if you put electron withdrawing groups on phosphorus, it can become poor sigma donor but very good pi acceptor. So this kind of flexibility in its synthesis, you cannot come across in carbon monoxide. That is the reason the tuning is very easy and hence phosphines are very popular when we use metal complexes containing phosphines as catalysts in homogeneous catalysis for several organic transformations. And similarly, Fischer carbines also there, here also back bonding is there, back bonding one can anticipate in the same way as carbon monoxide, but here already we have lone pairs within the ligand as a result what happens? This intra back bonding is more facile compared to inter back bonding that is from metal to ligand. As a result what happens? They become poor pi acceptors. So this also you can call this as intra back bonding also you can call it as negative hyperconjugation. Same thing is true in case of N heterocyclic carbines also. You should remember N also has a lone pair. This lone pair can also go to the pi star of carbine. As a result what happens? They are also poor pi acceptors but they are good sigma donors. So this is how you can compare these non-classical ligands in terms of their donor and acceptor properties. And then 18 electron rule is very important. It is not a must uh, to have a stable complex because many square planar complexes with uh, 16 electron are stable. For example, rhodium 1, iridium 1 and also uh, all D8 system, nickel 2, palladium 2, platinum 2, gold 1, all those things. But here 18 electron, counting 18 electron gives some idea about their possible utility in some reactions and other things. For example, if there are 18 electron complexes, you cannot use them for oxidative addition reaction or catalysts. Prior to that one, what happens? You have to get rid of a couple of ligands or you have to remove some electrons so that it is ready for oxidative addition reaction. And also it is very interesting to count electrons. So for the reason I have taken this interesting molecule again, we have here rhodium and iron and we have 5 carbonyl groups are there and one C7H8 is there, cycloheptatriene is there and that I have shown here. So now let us see how it satisfies 18 electron rule. First you should think of uh, a formal rhodium to iron bond and also why I have put more carbon monoxide ligands on iron is because it has less electrons compared to rhodium. It is a D7S2 system whereas D6S2 system. So now two are there and one rhodium, rhodium, rhodium iron bond is there and now you should place in such a way that both of them would be having 18 electrons, at least 17 electrons so that this comes through, one comes through rhodium iron metal metal bonding. So this is how you can show eta 4 and eta 3. So this is again very interesting. So like that many examples I have discussed, go through it and also you can find lot of examples in textbooks, try to solve them or best thing is every time you come across a metal complex, try to count electrons to see whether it satisfies 18 electron rule or not. So now it is about uh, metal to metal multiple bonding. Uh, this is very important with square planar complexes and having eclipsed geometry. Of course, I have discussed in length how they identified first in the rhenium complexes uh, in the group of F.A. Cotton when he was in MIT. And now we know that how to explain the bonding up to 5 bonds. Not 
4 bonds like quadruple bond up to 5 bonds are possible between two metal centers and then how uh, you know the bond formation takes place can be readily explained using even molecular orbital picture like this. And here you should uh, remember the fact that dz square and for this one what happens two metal complexes having square planar geometry should be eclipsed to each other. And in this case if you just ask me why x dx square y square is not used because that is already used for the formation of metal to ligand bond if you recall dsp2 hybridization from valence bond theory. So that means four orbits are left here dz square dyz dxz and dxy. Now one can comfortably use from two metals to establish metal metal bond like this. So this one is a sigma bond head on collision dz square dz square and dxz is like something like this and then dyz is something like this they are degenerate they can accommodate two electrons each and then we have dxy is there. So this is a weak interaction something like this. So one, one is this is a dz square one is dxz another dyz and then this is dxy, dxy will be like this. So now that is uh, called delta bonding between them weakest two overlapping among orbitals. What would happen to the number of electrons when you have d1 one electron is there. So then you can have uh, one electron from each results in sigma two double bond three triple bond and four quadruple bond if you have five again we start filling anti bonding orbitals. So triple bond d6 double bond d7 single bond and d8 everything is filled so bond order is 0 you cannot see a no formal metal metal bond can be seen in d8 system. You can see that one again I am showing you here d4 system how electron filling takes place in this order to see quadruple bonding. So all d4 system is square planar geometry have possibility of uh, showing quadruple bonding ok. So now it is even possible to have five bonds that is quintuple bonding for that one what happens you need one more orbital other orbital possible orbital is dx minus y square for that one you should ensure that metal has not utilized this dx square y square for establishment of metal to ligand bond in that case we have to go for further lower coordination uh, number for example if you take here in this case it has not used any of the d orbits for making metal metal bonding let us assume it has sp orbits are there these two sp orbits have used this one here and this one. So now all the five orbits are left and it also has five electrons in d orbitals. Now dxy and dxy is y square at an angle of 45 degree are degenerate similar to dxz and dyz. So you can have here 10 electrons so bond order is 5. So this is how you can explain very nicely using MO diagram quintuple bonding as well. I have given quite a few examples again go through it and in case if there is a problem always you can write to me. And this is important about hydrogen bonding to metal. In fact it is very significant uh, H to HH bond is quite strong and it is endothermic. It is not very easy to break as I mentioned if you take any unsaturated hydrocarbon and put high pressure hydrogen into it and in a closed vessel and if you try to heat it for several hours even hydrogenation happens with very very low conversion about 5 percent or 6 percent. But on the other hand you add a metal complex so that can happen even at room temperatures. Why that happens because how very nicely it drifts the electrons present between H through sigma bonding and also it pushes its own electrons through back bonding to sigma star. So that means you are taking away bonded electrons and they are pushing electrons to the anti-bonding. As a result what happens HH bond becomes weaker and then earlier it is a eta 1 bonding it becomes what happens a very nicely it adds oxidatively to form 2 MH bonds. So this, this is very very significant because of this property metal complexes have been extensively used in organic uh, transformation in homogeneous catalysis. So whether it is a HH bond, whether it is CH bond, whether it is CC bond or any other heteroatom to hydrogen bond they can do very conveniently as a result we come across the application of these complexes in many organic transformations. Of course still we have not succeeded or achieved to use in industrial scale the CC bond breaking. So for that one, one has to make very, very ideal compound where it is highly electron deficient and the ligands are uh, of poor sigma donor 
and coordination, low coordination is there. In that case, what happens? It should be ready to grab literally anything that comes on its way uh, to expand its coordination number. In this case, probably let us say if you put octane, it can go very nicely and it can break into two butyl groups. If that happens with base metals such as iron, cobalt, nickel or something, one can make fortune out of it. So, there is enormous, enormous scope to activate CC bond using metal complexes, but with cleverly designed ligands. And of course, here I showed you why NO plus is stable because if you once get rid of this one electron from pi star, it will be having bond order of 3, that is the reason it would be more stable. And also I, here I am showing you, uh, once this electron is gone and now NO plus is there, this can also behave very similar to other non-classical ligands and act as pi acceptor ligand. You can see here, I have shown sigma donation as well as pi acceptor. So, NO can also be used as a pi acceptor ligand and in some metal complexes we can see these things. And when we talk about phosphines, I mentioned about uh, electronic properties and steric properties are very important. The steric uh, influence, the magnitude of steric influence can be measured using Tallman's cone angle. What happens here, you take the ligand, make a bond to the metal with a distance of average distance of 2.28 uh, Einstein units or 228 picometer. Now imagine a conical surface at the metal that encloses the van der Waals surfaces of uh, ligand substituents over all possible rotational orientations. How this uh, controls the steric attributes you can see by looking into the uh, cone angles shown by different ligands having different substituents as bulkiness of the phosphorus substituents increases, cone angle increases. In that case what happens? You can have because of steric congestion you can stabilize metal with uh, fewer ligands. In that case what happens? We are automatically we are generating a low coordinated system having less electrons. In that case what happens these compounds are electron deficient and also coordinatively unsaturated as a result uh, they can readily undergo oxidative addition. For example, if you take uh, compound here phosphines, 4 phosphines are there in tetrahedral 18 electron system is there. The moment you put into solution because of steric congestion two ligands go out, so dissociation would be very easy. And now let us look into the metal to halide bonds. In metal to halide bonds also I discussed in length about uh, how certain ligands, certain metal complexes have tetrameric structure and some of them have dimeric structure, take even aluminum itself, aluminum fluoride if you look into it, it has a tetrameric structure like this, whereas aluminum chloride has a dimeric structure like the AlCl3 become Al2Cl6, Al2Cl6 it is not uh, aluminum oxide, it is a metal complex here, it is a transfer metal complex. But nevertheless, the reason is the smaller size. When the smaller size is there, because of more electrons are there, if it assumes a fluoride assumes a bent structure when it is bridging to two metal centers. In the bent structure, what happens? Two cations come very close to it, they repel. As a result, what happens? They would try to have a linear geometry. In that case, if you want to see association, that has to be minimum of tetrameric or in some cases trimeric also we come across. The preferred one is tetrameric and hence if you look into CuF22 plus or CrF22 plus, although it looks like uh, they have linear geometry, it is not linear geometry. The composition of copper to uh, fluorine is 1 is to 2 and but they have octahedral geometry something like this. And then oxidative addition is very important and I also discussed in length about different possible mechanisms. We have three bond concentrated addition is there and nucleophilic substitution reactions are there and also a radical mechanism also there. Okay, and also I discussed all those things and you can see uh, polar solvents are uh, going to the transpositions whereas non-polar bonds are going to the cis positions. So, you can see clearly distinguish between concentrated addition and also nucleophilic oxidative addition. And also I, I discussed about uh, uh, stereochemical consequences also and then trans effect is very important when it comes to substitution reactions in square planar complexes. What one should remember is in a given complex electron attracting ligands are apical and electron repelling groups are trigonal planar. So, when the incoming ligand is there, a pair having trans influencing group and a group trans to it and the incoming plane will be trigonal planar and other two will be axial. And in this case you have to identify which is electron attracting group and which is repelling group and accordingly if you generate the intermediate, the moment you generate intermediate you will come to know the conformation, what kind of conformation you are going to get at the end after substitution is completed. And of course, in case of octahedral complexes I did mention about uh, 
substitution how it happens incoming ligands can come to come on the same side of the group or they can come on the opposite side and accordingly what happens you can see how that influences the formation of cis isomer or trans isomer. And also I also discussed about stereochemical changes or stereochemical consequences in a substitution reaction on octahedral complexes. And when it comes to redox reactions we have two type of inner sphere coordination and outer sphere coordination. And in case of inner sphere coordination theory uh, we need a bridging ligand and this is how the intermediate would be there. And you can see here once electron transfer is over this also moves towards the other one that, that is getting oxidized. And then of course in, in outer sphere mechanism we have to keep Frank Condon principle in mind. And now you can see here T2G EG he is there in this one it is a high spin complex where it is a low spin complex before electron is transferred both of them should have a optimum bond length and bond angle. And now you can call it as intermediate stage where electrons can run smoothly so that this also does not disobey Frank Condon principle once the electron transfer takes place they will revert back to different ones. So, this becomes high spin and this becomes low spin. And then spectral interpretation I made an effort to make you familiar with uh, you know UV visible spectroscopy and also an MR spectroscopy to an extent IR spectroscopy uh, so that you can characterize those compounds or if you come across some spectra you should be able to interpret and uh, various methods and how we can arrive at the structure all those things I have shown in this chart. And of course, angular moment quantum number and uh, spin angular momentum how they interact I have shown here very nicely LS coupling and LS coupling is also very important when we talk about uh, UV visible spectroscopy and also in when we look into magnetic properties. And then of course, I classified uh, all d electronic configuration to 4 groups here there is a significance why we have uh, why have done like this here you can see only charge transfer transitions if the compounds are color it is because of charge transfer in this one ligand to metal in this one metal to ligand and in these cases we have one electron one less than uh, half field one more than half field and one less than completely field here in the same way we have 2 electrons and 2 less than half field, 2 more than half field and 2 less than completely field. So, these complexes show invariably 1 dd transition here they show invariably 3 dd transition of course, d5 is spin forbidden and Laporte forbidden and compounds are weakly colored or pale colored compounds and of course, all those things I discussed in depth. And this equation is very important when, when we talk about NMR and using this equation we can literally explain anything about NMR transition and other things. And what one should remember is if you look into spin selection rule delta s equals 0. So, that means basically a electron with upward spin should go like upward spin only whereas in case of NMR it is plus or minus 1 the flipping of nuclear spin I mentioned. So, electron with upward spin should go to exact state it will be having lower spin ok alpha becomes beta or something like that. So, this is very important and you can see here in this diagram precision results in the flipping this is through radio frequency applied in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field you can see clearly here. So, you should remember these things and then magnetism I did not have time to discuss about magnetism of course, you can find these things in standard books pretty easy and we use two equations and of course, here we are using uh, yes is the summation of uh, number of unpaid electrons here for example, as yes, if one electron is there yes equals half two electrons are there one and then three electrons three byte it goes like that here n is number of unpaid electrons both are essentially same and if we can also use this one where of course, you know already how to find out l as well as yes you can find out mu from this equation as well or in case of lanthanide and actinides we have to find out g. Uh, G is uh, 2.0023 and if in some cases only whenever we come across spin only treatment we can always consider G as 2. The splitting of orbital levels is larger relative to KT that is Boltzmann constant then one can use this equation here G into square root of J into J plus 1. G can be calculated provided we find out from electronic configuration what is S and what is L and of course, J one can also use value L plus or minus s depending upon whether the orbital is completely uh, less than half field or more than half field. If it is more than half half field we use l plus s, if it is less than half field we use l minus s. Where we should consider you know orbital contribution we have to see they should be differentially especially T2G orbits in case of octahedral complexes and T2 orbits in case of tetrahedral complexes should be differentially occupied. 
In that case, what happens? You can see spin orbital contribution. The moment you look into the electronic configuration, you should be able to make out whether spin orbital contribution is coming or not. For example, in case of octahedral, T2G1, T2G2, T2G4, and T2G5 have unsymmetrical filling. In that case, you come across uh, orbital contribution, and same thing is true in case of tetrahedral, except of course here G should be removed because it does not have central symmetry, it should be T21, T22, T24 and T25 for tetrahedral complexes. And you can see here with 45 degree rotation dxy can become dx minus y square and similarly with 90 degree rotation dyz can become dxz. So at last I dedicate this lecture series to my beloved parents, my father and my mother. One year before I submitted my thesis my father passed away and two years back my mother passed away and uh, these people uh, taught me high ethics in me and because of them what I am today. So I dedicate uh, this lecture series to my parents and also you should remember parents always work hard to make you a better citizen and educated and they sacrifice everything. So in that context I always try to remember parents and of course in some cases what happens I have seen students, parents force their children to opt for a particular topic in which the student a son or daughter is not interested. In that case what happens you should try to convince them why you are interested in this one and why you are not interested in what they are imposing. Certainly you can convince them and you can take a right path and achieve greater success. And I am sure I had conveyed some chemistry through these 60 lectures and I have put lot of effort. You should remember lot of effort I have put in generating some of the slides to convincingly teach some chemistry and when you understand the chemistry behind uh, these 60 lectures and uh, you know pass exams with good grades and if you at the end if you think that yes I got something out of this course I will be very happy and in case if you have any problem you can always write to me and later when you achieve higher success and in case if you think that this course has contributed to your improvement, your knowledge and when you achieve greater success and achieve something and make a mark and if you just send me a mail I will be the happiest person and that brings millions worth happiness to me. So with this I wish you all very very best and God bless you all, enjoy chemistry, thank you so much. Learning never stops, even now. I am learning, I can say without any hesitation, I am a good student of learning, underline good student of learning because I do not claim any time that I am a teacher because I have to learn a lot even now and that means no matter what you do, learning should never stop. So learning should continue and so that we can have more and more knowledge and when we have enough knowledge, it is our sincere duty to dissipate it to others. Thank you once again.